guys, it's Sophie. So today I wanted to share my reading from March that is not part of the two prizes that I am working my way through at the minute. Um, so if you don't know, I'm also trying to read the long list for the Gillette Prize and the Women's Prize and I'm going to make another video talking about my thoughts on those books so far. So this is all the non-prize reading I've done. I've read a lot this month. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna start and kick off. Um, they're not non-fiction fiction ordered, so let's go. Um, so the first one is Savage Appetites by Rachel Monroe, which is a non-fiction book about true crime. Well, it's kind of about true crime and kind of about the people who are interested in true crime. And it splits them into four different categories. The detective, the victim, the defender and the killer for the kind of orientations that people have who enjoy true crime. Um, I definitely think if you are into true crime podcasts or like documentaries or books, um, this one's worth having a read through. It's very self-referential um, about the genre and about what people get from the genre rather than being a container of any true crime. So I think you probably need to be into it a little bit to read it, um, but it just has li cool little illustrative stories for each of the different types and sort of how she describes them as interacting in the true crime world. Um, it also has some kind of writing at the beginning about, um, I suppose, her, not quite like incredulity, but kind of the, the feeling around the true crime community, slightly feeling like fandoms. Um, and in fact, one of the stories as you go through shows how that can go really badly wrong in the aspect of Tumblr. So yeah, definitely one for the true crime fans. I enjoyed it a lot. Then the next one I read was A Present from Acacia um, and it is Who Was Changed and Who Was Dead by Barbara Combs. Um, this book was written a while ago and this is a republish. Um, it was published in the 1950s um, and the kind of essence of the story is that there is a small village um, with a house with a very very horrible grandmother in it and a, little, a family who are kind of all under her thumb. Um, they're the wealthy house in the village and the rest of the village doesn't really interact with them that much. Things start going a little bit strange and there's a sort of catching madness that goes through the village and influences how the people in the village are acting and the things that they do. Um, it starts with a enormous flood in the middle of summer which like floods ducks into their house. Um, it's definitely a small kind of English story, not that creepy but like more violent than I was expecting. So yeah, that was Who Has Changed and Who Is Dead. Then I have Before the Coffee Gets Cold by Toshikazi Kawaguchi. Um, this is a cool little sci-fi tangential story about a coffee shop in Japan where if you sit in a specific table, you can travel back in time. But there are some quite strict guidelines about what you can do when you're traveling back in time, who you'll see, how long you have, etc. Um, and the stories told through different examples. One is the lovers, one is the sisters, one's the husband and wife. And the final is the mother and child. Um, and we introduce these little characters coming into the coffee shop and the interactions that they choose to have with their past. Very soft and easy to read. Um, and yeah, it was a nice sort of real world sci-fi thing, like a little real world, but with one aspect of kind of magic thrown in. Then the next one I have is Tristing by Manuel Pagano and the way I would kind of describe this is like tiny snippets about people who love other people. So it's all told in like teeny tiny vignettes, there's no characters, there's no story, um, it is just small moments of love, whether that's positive or whether that is negative. And I actually really enjoyed reading this. At first I was like, oh, am I really going to want to read whatever it is, like 250 pages, 150 pages of snippets. Um, but I was surprised how many I related to, how many I didn't relate to and was glad. And it made me feel really appreciative of the love I have in my life. Um, so it's, it's definitely a very specific thing, but I enjoyed the process of reading it and, and breaking down through it and imagining new little lives. Um, it kind of made me want to think like if I was going to put something down as a snippet, for the loves I've had in my life, what would they look like? So nice, slightly kind of arty, but, but interesting. Then next I have Star Baker by Andrew Michael Hurley. Really enjoyed this book. I read it in my week off in February, um, which crept into the beginning of March. 
Um, and this is about a family who are living in a large rural house following the death of their son. The man is trying to excavate in a field behind the house the remains of an enormous tree that was described in kind of mythology of the town. Um, when we start, we know very little about the content or the reasons behind the son's death, um, only that the wife has been completely torn apart by the death. She is engaging in quite strange behaviours, um, which are kind of grief behaviours, but she's clearly not very well at the same time. Um, and it just gets into rural horror, it would be probably rural like folk horror, it's probably how I'd describe it. Um, and the way it does so, I don't want to spoil it, but the way it does so, it feels quite creeping, like it kind of like sneaks up on you. Um, yeah, and I, I really enjoyed it. I wanted to read The Loney by Andrew Michael Hurley for a while and it never quite like tipped over. Then I picked up Starbaker and I've now bought The Loney, that'll be my next read. Then another non-fiction, this is Uncanny Valley by Anna Weiner. I read this so fast, I read it in what like one evening after work. Um, it's, it's a workbook essentially, um, but it's a story about a young woman who used to work in publishing and basically decides that she wants more money in her life, that's basically her decision, is she's like, where can I make more money? So she joins a startup that is looking to kind of digitise reading to a greater extent and trying to um, attract readers to more digital marketplaces because these aren't so good for app designers. Um, so she kind of starts off in this odd world and it is it kind of follows her career journey through Silicon Valley in these strange misogynist, money fueled workplaces and her place within them and how easily she finds it to slip inside of that world and away from the kind of artistic publishing world that she used to know. Um, I really enjoyed it, like it, it kind of semi romanticises for the first half of Silicon Valley and then it just tears everything down um, and I, I quite like reading about stuff to do with people's work <laughs> um, but I think it's a really interesting memoir about how you can go to work in those kind of places and what it might actually feel like alongside why is it good, alongside why is it bad, like not Silicon Valley is terrible all round but what what made her stay there, what made her move there. Um, yeah, just a, just a little niche interest book probably but I really liked it. Then another non-fiction on the list I have They Were Her Property by Stephanie E. Jones Rogers. And this was, I think this was my Christmas present from Acacia, lots of Acacia reading this month. Um, and this is essentially a story which speaks to the impact that white women had on the slave market. Um, and I actually listened to this one on audiobook um, just because it was fairly big and the text is fairly small. Um, and it is a very specific subject area, so it's a fairly academic style in terms of um, it's seeking to describe and explore what the role of white women was in slavery and sort of refuting some of the research that's been produced that would suggest that it was a kind of male only pursuit to be a slave owner or involved in the slave trade with lots of little examples of that. Um, and yeah, I think I think it's actually fairly accessible despite the the tone being more academic. Um, and I, yeah, I did really like it. I would recommend it on, on Audible actually. Um, I thought the narrator did a really good job and it kind of flew past, like it was it was very easy to listen, not easy to listen to, but it, the style of it was quite easy to listen to, um, whilst the content was definitely not. Um, yeah, so that was that was kind of again like a little niche non-fiction, um, but if you're interested it is a good, good, fairly accessible book. Then the next one I read was English Animals by Laura Kay um, and I was a little bit disappointed with this but only because I'd hoped it was going to be more like Starbaker. So if I read you the back of the book, um, it says I opened my mouth to say something but she ran up the stairs and into the house. I'd imagined arriving at the house so many times but it was never like this. I realised I knew nothing about these people. Richard and Sophie sounded like good names for good people but they could be anything. They could be completely crazy. So I thought there was going to be a creepy turn to the book and to be honest there really isn't. Um, I still liked it. it, I think just my expectations were a little bit dampened because it wasn't the book I thought I was going to be reading. Um, 
but in brief it's about a woman who has emigrated to the UK um, and she's sort of worked a few jobs in London, doesn't really like it, wants to see a bit more of the England she kind of perceived as like rolling fields and lush estates. So she takes up a sort of job um, to go and help these people out who live in this large rural house. Um, it's a couple and they sort of bring her into the world of taxidermy. There's also a woman woman love story within this book, um, or kind of love story, romance maybe. Um, but yeah, it was softer and much less creepy than I'd imagined. But I did like it. I read it fairly quickly. Again, I read this one on my week off. Um, I just I just had expected it was going to be a bit creepy from the back. That's all. That's my only my only misgiving about it. And then the final one. I feel like I've spoken about this already. So if I have apologies, but I I finished Shaggy Bane. Um, this is another one that I listened to on Audible. I listened to this whilst playing Animal Crossing. Like, all of it I listened to whilst playing Animal Crossing. I have quite mixed feelings about Shaggy Bane. I did like, like, by the time I got to the end, I liked it, but I found it a real slog. Um, I felt like it read very slow. I felt like the story took an awful lot of time to warm up. Um, in, in kind of brief description, it's about a young boy who's growing up with a mother who is an alcoholic and his life growing up around her um, and kind of the ebbs and falls of his life around that. Um, the young boy is gay and he kind of figures that out within the book, but it's more about his mum than it is anything else. And I think the like nature of alcoholism I just found quite like crushing <laughs> to read about in the way that some other things that are very dark and negative I don't. Um, I can see why so many people have liked it, but it felt like, I felt like I had the same problems that some people have with a little life, whereas I didn't have that with a little life. So yeah, Shaggy Bane, another one in the kind of slightly like misery porn genre. So that's everything that I read that was not on prize lists in the month of May, which feels like quite a lot of books. Um, so yeah, I'll be filming two other sort of wrap up review videos for the books that I read from prize lists in March. So keep an eye out for those soon and look after yourselves until I see you again. Bye.